Doug, mm-hmm. if, if, well, you're a little younger than me, but if you're like me, you know, a kid, a kid of the, a child of the eighties, right? <laughs> I grew up with, I grew up with the, the, the youth pop culture, what I was allowed to see as a young Mormon, which wasn't a lot. Like the GoBots and, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, uh, he man, you know, yeah, GI Joe, but you know, what was a huge, what was a huge thing in, in movies and culture at the time was the Corys. Right, <laughs> you had you had Corey Haim, you had Corey Feldman, they they were ride or die together, right? Those two little cuties, and they were just in everything. You know, the Lost Boys, and probably other movies. Yeah, that I can't remember, but it was all about the Corys, yeah, the Goonies. Uh, I do remember the Goonies. That, the Goonies. Oh yeah, yep. well Corey Haim wasn't in the Goonies. Sure he was. We'll no, just say was, he was. That was Sean Astin. <laughs> no, no, I think they're the same person. Oh, okay, Corey, fine, fair enough. Corey Heyman, <laughs> Sam Wise, Gan- Ganji is the same person. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I don't know if if did did you enjoy the Corys, Daniel? No, well, not as much as you did, but uh, I mean, yeah, probably. I mean, you know, only one of them made it uh, this far, and yeah. we're, and the truth is, while one of them did die, I don't know which one of them actually made it this far. I don't know if. Corey Feldman, who who lived, I don't know if he's the one that we can say made it, because uh, <laughs> he's going the distance. Is, yeah. Anyway, uh, look, I am going to talk about a Corey, uh, too. But before I get there, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about something I I recently watched, and I think I think you guys may have watched at least some of this too. Uh, I, I watched as much as I was able to stomach of a debate. Uh, it took place a few weeks ago on Zoom and pitted friend of the show and fufferf attorney Andrew Seidel mm. against Christian Gasbag and 80s kid adventure movie bad guy Tom Trento. <laughs> I only watched the closing statement, which was beautiful. Uh, yes. Andrew did an extraordinary job with that. Yeah. Uh, throughout the whole thing, Andrew was clear and incisive and fair in his treatment of the subject, where Trento, unfortunately... Uh, couldn't even see or hear Andrew, uh, and instead was having a totally different debate with the Andrew-shaped straw man that he had set up (laughs) next to his webcam. Uh, Which is to say that he completely ignored the reality of the person he was debating and just plowed forward with a plan he had crafted ahead of time. That plan had nothing to do with the ostensible topic of the debate, nor did he address or even acknowledge anything that the good Mr. Seidel had said. Uh, after a while, the whole thing descended into chaos with Trento trying desperately to trap Andrew with multiple choice questions that didn't include the correct answers <laughs> and throwing oh. tantrums when he wouldn't just choose one of the options and shut up. Well, how else I, is he going to win a debate? Right? Exactly. Uh, I wouldn't bother watching the whole thing uh, if I were any of you, though, as Uncle Mark says, Andrew's opening and closing speeches both knock it out of the park. Yeah. So they he's, he's so he's watching. so brilliant and 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 decent. Yeah, and uh, and easy on the eyes too. He's a handsome. He's a handsome a fella, isn't he? <clears throat> if you like those clean cut types. <laughs> uh, the reason I bring this up is because it is the latest for me in a very long line of moments where a believer has decided that the atheist that they've constructed in their mind is obviously far more honest and real than anything an actual atheist might say. So they just ignore the real people that are right in front of them and valiantly go to battle against the straw man army of their imaginations. They applaud each other as they bravely scarecrow as they bra- bravely slay scarecrow after scarecrow, never bothering themselves with the distant sounds of real honest arguments. Meanwhile, we non-believers sit on our park benches watching the whole live action role play as they stab their dull prop swords into dummies with our names scrawled on them. And then they go off to regale their churches with the noble story of their righteous victory over the savage heathens. It's a tale as old as time. Yeah. (laughs) And today I'm going to prove that I'm going to talk about an OG straw man that goes back more than 2,000 years. <laughs> but only if you actually believe what Mormons believe. Otherwise, it goes back 200 years. <laughs> because that's when Joseph Smith fabricated a pretend ancient record of Jews in the Americas. For today's lesson, we're going to talk about one of the great characters in the Book of Mormon. Not that there's much competition. <laughs> 
Korahor. One of the Corys. Yeah. So, Korahor comes to us and leaves us in a single chapter of the Book of Alma. For anyone stupid enough to have attempted to have read the Book of Mormon all the way through, you know that Alma, which is Book 9 of 15, is the one where you finally lose the will to live completely. <laughs> Coming in at 63 chapters, it's almost twice as long as any of the other books. Our boy Korahor comes in, uh, joins the party in chapter 30. So, yeah, it's, it's a brutal, brutal book. It's I, a slog, man. Yeah, I think... You know, I, I, I think we often encourage our listeners to, like, go ahead and go to the source material and, you know, learn stuff for yourself, obviously. But, like, don't don't read this book. Not this book. Good don't, God. Yeah. Believe me. Right. Don't read this book. We're, we're doing it so you don't have to. Exactly. So, chapter 30 starts in the land of Zarahemla, which is one of our favorite ones, uh, with the Nephites, who are God's good, white, and delightsome little boys and girls— Burying their dead after a huge battle with the Lamanites, who are God's dark-skinned baddies. Uh, the surviving Lamanites are kicked out. The Nephites have some, of their, have some days of fasting and mourning and prayer. And then, since they got rid of all the dark people, quote, There began to be continual peace throughout the land. Oh my god. <laughs> Not racist at all. No, no, no. Shut up. Uh, literally everybody was good and kept all the commandments and shit. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's weird that Clive and Bundy loves this book, isn't it? I just had that in random thought. <laughs> right? Yeah. Strange. Well, and it's such a trope in throughout the Book of Mormon, um, especially in the Book of Alma, but, but, but throughout, that entire populations just all act as one character. Right. Yeah. You know, there's just no so individual, the, no individuality. Or there's no faction. percent Yeah, there's no factions. There's no... Um, nuance. It's just like difference the of opinion. Were, yeah, the people right. were righteous. The people were evil. The people were yeah. evil. The people were righteous. It's fucking well, and that's exactly it. This is a classic Joseph Smith move here. You fix all of the problems, literally make everything perfect for years, then realize that you have a that you have to have conflict to have a story and right. go. Blah, 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 oh, uh, 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 they turn their which, hearts away from God again. again. Yeah. Right. Which does make me wonder how many angry, frustrated grumbles Martin Harris heard from behind the curtain as Joseph was dictating. <laughs> I, I imagine it to be something like this. Joseph says, And thus the people did have no disturbance in all the 16th year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. Uh, and it came to pass that in the commencement of the 17th year of the reign of the judges, there was continual peace so <laughs> shit, um, shit, 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 shit. it's amazing well, it's amazing how long you can you can stretch out nothing happened right exactly <laughs> or martin harris is probably like hey joseph is it gonna pick up anytime soon <laughs> right oh yeah yeah uh, oh. sure 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 let's take lunch and then we'll come back <laughs> and uh, pick it up so anyway when they did get back from lunch joseph introduces <laughs> the story of Korahor, and it's a hell of an introduction. Uh, verse 6 comes out swinging at this guy. Quote, There came a man into the land of Zarahemla, and he was Antichrist, for he began to preach unto the people against the prophecies which had been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. Boom! <laughs> That's what passes for character building in this book. <laughs> yep. He's new in town, and he's Antichrist. He's wearing he, a he sign that says bad guy. Yeah, exactly. And he literally might be one of the most nuanced characters in the Book of Mormon. It's yeah, amazing we'll get to in that. that in that moment that Joseph Smith didn't invent a pre you know pre Columbian railroad for him to tie a woman to. A hundred percent. Yes, exactly. Now he's not the Antichrist, mind you. He's just Antichrist. Yeah. Later he is. He's a an Later, he's a an Antichrist, so lots of ways to use that phrase, I guess. Anyway, uh, the point is that we're supposed to hate him, and that's about all we know about him for a minute. Then the book answers the question we're all asking, which is, if he's preaching against the prophecies, why isn't he getting his ass kicked? Well, yeah. now, 
Now we get to several verses about the Zarahemla criminal justice system. Oh, my God. It, it turns out that in ancient Mesoamerica, you were legally allowed to believe or not believe. Isn't that nice? And there are several verses justifying this position because old Joseph was clearly deeply ambivalent about whether heathens should be allowed to speak or not. Right. But... The Nephites of Zarahemla landed on, yes, you can be a disgusting, evil, Satan-worshipping, shitbag atheist if you want to, perv. And the good book uh, gives a series of reasons why God wants it that way. God wants an open society where people are free to believe what they want, and they have the legal right to talk about their beliefs freely. Put a pin in that. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, seven verses later, we're back to this Antichrist, which in this book is hyphenated with both words capitalized, by the way. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, he finally gets a name, the name Korahor. Uh, and even though we just had an entire opening arguments episode about alternative religious views in Nephite law, it is once again emphasized that he's legally allowed to do this, no matter how mad that makes you. Mm. Anyway, Korahor is preaching that there will be no Christ. Remember, this takes place before Jesus. This is like B.C. 75 or something like that. So they're still waiting for this Messiah. And that there's no God and that there's no evidence that the prophecies are true. He says, quote, O oh, ye that are bound down under a foolish and vain hope, why do ye yoke yourselves with such foolish things? Why do you look for a Christ? For no man can know anything which is to come. Behold, these things which ye call prophecies, which ye say are handed down by holy prophets, behold, they are foolish traditions of your fathers. So. I like this guy. Yeah. That all feels pretty right. That, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Great. And here's what's interesting about this chapter. Joseph Smith, like all the screenwriters of all of the best god-awful movie episodes, <laughs> has to thread a needle here. If he wants the character to be at all believable, which, you know, it's the Book of Mormon, why start now, but whatever, he has to try to make him make some sense. But he can't make too much sense, or, you know, readers might realize that he's actually, you know the one who's right so right. joseph smith throws in classic a, the, a classic atheist straw man which is people who leave the church just want to sin mm. now this one's ubiquitous in the modern era if you google why do people come become atheists or why do people leave the church and you find a christian website's answer i guarantee you somewhere on that page you'll find this they just want to sin yeah now, nobody that I've ne ever met or even heard of became an atheist because they wanted to sin. No. Well, and religious people have no problem sinning. They do it all the time. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, they exactly. go back to church on Sunday. It's no fucking biggie. <laughs> right. Yeah, consi yeah. consider fact, the source a... of this material we're reading right now. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, totally. Uh, now, I will say this. There are some folks who eventually noticed that God's rules about sex were stupid and that led them to realize that God might not be real. And then they went on to have a delightful and less fettered sex life. But that's not leaving because you want to sin. That's leaving because you realize that you were lied to and then sinning. Well, and, and, leaving and then it's aside, not sinning. It's not sinning. Right. The central contradiction there is that if I'm not in religion, those religious, you know, re religiously mandated sins are not sins. Right. It's right. just having a drink <clears throat> or getting a blowjob. They, though they often... <laughs> Though they, they will often say, uh, I've heard many a, a believer say, well, you, you still believe, you just want to sin, so you pretend like you don't believe. Also put a pin in that. <laughs> anyway, old Korahor said, quote, There could be no atonement made for the sins of men, but every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature, I guess meaning we're all just animals. Therefore, every man prospered according to his genius, and, and that every man conquered according to his strength, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. What atheists believe is that you can do whatever you want, and since there's no God to tell you what's right or wrong, there's no such thing as crime, and everything is a goddamn free-for-all. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's how I've lived what, my life entirely. <laughs> it's what we're all about. It's why the, the prisons are packed with atheists. Yeah. Positively overflowing. Uh, now, regardless of that stupidity... Apparently, a guy talking mostly reasonably about the logical problems of magic daddies in the sky and wizards predicting the future was a welcome diversion in perfect step 40 in Zarahemla, and a bunch of people started listening and liking what they were hearing. And women and men immediately turned to, quote, committing whoredoms. Yeah. That's what <laughs> Corey happens. whoredoms. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. Huh? He's got his own. He's, he should get a T-shirt. Huh? Well, that's his podcast. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Anywho, Korahor did didn't stay in Zarahemla. He uh, he took a show on the road. He went to the land of Jershon to preach to the people of Ammon, who used to be Lamanites. Uh, they're the evil, dark-skinned ones. Remember. But here's a twist: these guys were more wise than the Nephites. It mm. literally says that. And they immediately bound Korahor and dragged him in front of Ammon, who was the high priest, who ordered him to be, quote, carried out of the land. Okay. <laughs> but Uncle Dan, didn't we spend an oddly long amount of time talking about how it was good and God ordained that people be free to preach whatever they want? Shut up! <laughs> yeah, this literally. Is a different, it's a different time now, idiot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally, I guess. I just love that the place where they are more wise are, is the place where they're going against God's idea of how the law is supposed to go. But anyway. Well, I also love the idea that Martin Harris was probably from behind the curtain going, hey, you know how you wrote that stuff about, you know, freedom of speech? Don't right. you want to set up a theocracy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. It's literally, this This chapter goes back and forth on that issue a dozen times. It's It's... Your head starts to spin. Anyway, then Korahor tried his shtick in the land of Gideon, and they bound him and took him to the high priest and the chief judge of the land named Gedona. Now, I'm I'm not I'm gonna read a pretty big section of this because it's the first time we actually hear what Korahor says. And well, it's pretty fucking compelling. <laughs> so this is him talking to Gedona, the high priest. Ye say that this people is a free people. Behold, I say they are in bondage. Ye say that those ancient prophecies are true. Behold, I say ye don't, you do not know that they are true. Ye say that these people, uh, that this people is a guilty and fallen people because of the transgression of a parent. Behold, I say that a child is not guilty because of his, its parents. And ye also say that Christ shall come, but behold, I say ye do not know there, that, uh, you do not know that there shall be a Christ, and ye also say that he shall be slain for the sins of the world, and thus ye lead the people, oh, you lead away this people after the foolish traditions of your fathers, and according to your own desires, and you keep them down even as they were in bondage. That they might glut, oh, that ye might glut yourselves with the labors of their hands, and they durst not look up, look, look up with boldness, and that they durst not enjoy their rights and privileges. Yea, they durst not make use of that which is their own, lest they should be, lest they should offend their priests who do yoke them according to their desires and have brought them to believe by their traditions and their dreams and their whims and their, and their visions and their pretend mysteries that they should, if they did not do according to their words, offend some unknown being who they say is God, a being who, has never, who, has, who, has, who never has been seen or known, who never was nor ever will be. To me... That is a pretty shocking slam dunk. Corey, Corey Horton, yeah. you want to come on the show? Like, exactly. Right? Yeah. I, 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 excellent work. Yeah. Reading from an outsider's perspective, that is some hard-hitting skepticism. Yeah. yeah. 
Anyway, uh, and the high priest... Very reasonable. Totally reasonable. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the high priest did what all believers do when they hear a skeptic challenge their beliefs. He told Korahor that his heart was hard and shipped him back to Zarahemla. Because <laughs> that's good writing. Why did we leave anyway? We're, if we're just going back. Uh, to stand <coughs> before the big boss, <coughs> Alma. Skun dun dun. Now, Alma's is the guy who's going to set things right. He's the great, wise high priest who has the apologetics to put Korahor Hitchens in his place. (laughs) First, he tackles the claim that the priests make money off the labor of the people. And for this, he uses the classic uh, apologetic, (laughs) Nuh-uh. Do not. He literally takes several paragraphs to say, "Uh, I make my own money, so shut up. Then they say they get to the real stuff. Alma asks Korahor if he believes in God and in Christ. Korahor says, no. Hasn't he made Alma that says, completely clear already? Yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Alma says, he Alma starts to do the classic <clears throat> logical fallacy and says, What evidence have ye that there is no God or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you that ye have none, save it is your word only thereby demonstrating that not only does he not understand who has the burden of proof, but that he doesn't recognize that his own arguments can be turned back to him. Because guess whose word only is also the only evidence for the other side. Then he makes his big proof that God does indeed exist. Things. You know, all the things. That's literally his argument. He's shocked that Korahor can't see it, frankly. Yeah. So Korahor does the final gambit. (laughs) He asks for evidence that God is real. Show me a sign, he says, and I'll believe. Now, in real life, that is a 100% reasonable thing to ask. Yeah. But Alma's like, but the things, look at all the things. That's your goddamn sign. So Korahor just refuses to acknowledge the things and uh, and says that's not a very good argument. He's such a stubborn yeah, guy. Yeah, it's, it's Aquinas' five ways, right? Right. It's, uh, uh, look, there is a world. Someone made it. <coughs> look, yeah. the stars move. Someone makes them. It's like, okay, that's, yeah. that's pretty deep. Just, but Great. it's the same argument over and over again, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Where did it all so, come from? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So... This is the point in the story where it takes a Tarantino pivot, (laughs) where we take one moment in this godforsaken book that feels slightly realistic, and we plunge it into adolescent doofus-style magic reality revenge stupidity. Mm -hmm. Alma says, you want a sign? I'll show you a sign. Since you won't shut up and stop ruining God for everybody, God will shut you up. And with that, Korahor is struck dumb. Permanently. And with that, Korahor, like a good and consistent skeptic that he has always been, admits in writing (laughs) that he was wrong and that God must exist because he can't speak anymore. Do you think he was carrying his own gold plate to jot that down on or do they provide (laughs) you with one in the court? (laughs) What's really funny, and I didn't write this, but what's really funny is that when they ask him, do you believe in God now? Somebody writes it to him as though he can't hear him. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph was such a dumbass. Oh like, my God. Just Lord. ask him. It's fine. That's anyway, so um, great. They write it to him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, there's another popular believer straw man right there uh, because about, about how he always... They throw the they throw the in this uh, the straw man about how he always secretly believed deep down and that Satan tricked him by coming to him like an angel to tell him that there was no God because well if he was an angel wouldn't know, he think there was a God right yeah non belief so often starts with an angelic visitation <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> that was my road to skepticism as a supernatural being <laughs> right appearing exactly to me. <laughs> but honestly oh, really God. who's the bad guy here. Korahor has conflicting beliefs based on lack of evidence, and once he gets good evidence, even though it fucks him up for life, he acknowledges it. But that's not the takeaway that we're supposed to get. 
No. Korahor is pronounced wicked and ends up going door to door begging for food because apparently mute people can't work. <laughs> and everyone who has believed him reverts back to being a good little, ch good little church mouse. And eventually, Korahor was viciously trampled to death. Oh, my God. And lest you think that I'm skewing how the book presents this fate, I'll leave you with the actual final verse of the chapter, which has a rare moral of the story style ending. And thus we see the end of him who perverteth the ways of the Lord. Thus we see that the devil will not support his children at the last day, but doth speedily drag them down to hell. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Yeah, so he's, he should stand as a shining example of the power of the gospel, right? right? And, and he should be like what, you know, that's what they sh should be teaching missionaries in the, the MTC is, look, Corey Hoare was convinced it took striking him mute, and then there were some scribblings in the courtroom, yada, yada. Right. But, but look, the hardest of hearts can be changed. And, and according to their own belief system, Corey Hoare became a good guy. Am I wrong? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I think the, 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 the takeaway from this story, at least from their perspective, is don't ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Right? Truly. Literally. Yeah. It's meant to chill, to put a chill into the spine of anyone who would dare ask for a sign or ask for evidence or ask for any kind of like reality-based reason to believe this. Well, and I don't know, Dan, if you're gonna if you're gonna go the, go here, but I do know a lot of people who had uh, a faith crisis because of this story. Oh, really? really? Uh huh. In the same way that I know of some people who had faith crises because of the story of Jesus and the fig tree. Huh? Because you know, like it says in that story, it wasn't fig season. Jesus went up to the fig tree. It didn't have figs, so he fucked it up. Yeah. yeah. Like it, yeah, and in this story, like Korhor is making valid points. He has questions. He wants to know, and God strikes him dumb. Right. And 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 he says, "I oh, I believe," and it ends up being you know a poor beggar, and like, trampled and to getting death. trampled yeah. to death. Yeah. Like, Literally. What, so what's the what's the point of changing your mind? Yeah. The, what, or, you know, like what value uh, is there? Yeah. And if you're you know you read this story and you're like, okay, here's the problem I'm having. The lesson of the story is I'm not supposed to ask questions, but the story has caused me to have questions. What the yeah, fuck am yeah. I supposed to do with that? Yeah. Well, it's a mess. It's a it's a fun little thing. And again, every time we do a story in the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> it's just a lesson in why we don't why we edit. Why we don't yeah. claim that our book uh, was directly translating from <laughs> another book that's directly from God. And th and thus make it so that we can't actually like you know edit it down. Yeah, now they're stuck with this garbage, this mess of a story forever. It's an albatross around their necks. But there you go. There you go. All so, right. Well, uh, the third Corey. Yep. Go get out there and have a have a Corey horror of a time, and let's move on. Oh.